and welcome to this evening's presentation. I'm Diane Okonski, President of the Icelandic National League of the United States, and I'm very happy you're able to join us for tonight's program. It, first, a couple of logistical things before we get started. As attendees to the program, you are on mute, but we want to make sure that you uh, have an opportunity to ask your questions. So at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A button that we would like you to click when you have a question. If you click on it, you can type your question in. If you're on a phone or a tablet, that button may be in the upper right-hand corner, or you may have to swipe in order to find it. But please don't let that stop you. We want to have your questions come in, and we will answer as many as we can uh, at the end of the program. Also, this program is being recorded and will be available on the INL US website in just a few days. Tonight, we are very happy to have with us Sverre Sigurdsson and his wife, Veronica Lee, to discuss their book, Viking Voyager, um, an Icelandic memoir. Conducting this interview tonight is fellow author Solveig Egerts, who talked with us last September about her latest book, Sigia Vreykjavik. Solveig, I'll now turn the program over to you, and you can introduce um, Sverre and Veronica. Welcome to all. Well, I am delighted to be here with uh, these two co-authors of the book, and um, they are from very distant places, yet they are married to one another, which is extremely interesting because their marriage seems to have survived the writing of the book. So first of all, Ver Veronica Lee was born in Thailand. She grew up in Hong Kong. And then at age 15, she came to this country with her parents and received, uh, earned a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and returned to Hong Kong and became a journalist and worked there for several years. Ultimately, she moved back to the US and joined the World Bank and ended up traveling quite a bit uh, for the World Bank. But she is, in addition to writing this book, she's written three other books and her work sometimes inspired her. And an example of that is a thriller that she wrote called Nightfall in Mogadishu, based on two very um, exciting years that she spent in Somalia. Sverrir, on the other hand, is 100% Icelandic, and he's born in Reykjavik. He says that he was born at the National Hospital in the hall because uh, the, due to overcrowding. But he grew up on Tjarnargata, which some of you may know is the, um, is the street of just above the pond. And um, he, uh, and he, he attended the school, uh, Menta School in Reykjavik, the classical school, and um, graduated from there in, when he was 19. So he, from there, so this school prepares you uh, for the university. And by the way, it's a school that I went to also several years after Sverdi. So I was very excited to read about his perspective on the school. And it prepares you for the university and Sverdrid decided to go to Finland, which may be considered an odd choice because um, Finnish is not related to any of the Scandinavian languages and, or, nor English. <laughs> so the language was a huge challenge. Nevertheless, Sverdrid succeeded in achieve, getting a, an a degree in architecture, in 1966 and began to work for uh, private companies and then for UNESCO and for World Bank. And, and for the World Bank, he ended up traveling all around the world with a focus on education in the sense that um, he oversaw construction of schools and the development of education in uh, developing countries. Um, so that was, um, that was what he, he did. Um, and I learned all this from reading his book. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed this book. 
First of all, as an Icelander, I loved hearing Sverre's perspective on all things Icelandic. Um, but I especially, and well, I, and I want to say that I think that this book would appeal to any um, person interested in Iceland, but also to people who might be interested in how the World Bank works, how it does its reconstruction and development projects. Um, but uh, what uh, endeared me especially to this book was the expansive style of it. This is not just uh, this, a, a narrow story of a boy growing up. Sveted looks to his ancestors and with Veronica at his side, she, who also has an orientation to ancestors, this becomes a meaningful aspect of the book. He looks to his grandfather, Thorkell Magnusson, died uh, was, uh, on, a, on a ship, Gida, in 1910. Uh, he was the captain of this fishing boat and everyone on board drowned in the very turbulent seas of the North Atlantic. A huge tragedy. He was just in his 40s. His widow was destitute and, um, and Sveta's mother at the time was just 18 months old. So this is a family tragedy. But the way Sveta and Veronica look at the material, they put these ancestors in the context of Iceland's history and Iceland's uh, um, situation uh, so sociologically and culturally. So that this family tragedy is expanded into an explanation of the, uh, or a, um, yeah, a, an explanation, a, a story of the fishing industry in Iceland. And you come away understanding how incredibly dangerous it was to be a fisherman and still today um, to be a fisherman in the, in the North Atlantic. Similarly, I've got to say also that his <laughs> description of the farm is extremely interesting to me. Um, his father, he describes his father's uh, life on the farm where he grew up, but Sveted himself uh, spent summers on a farm in Myrdal, um, uh, which is near Vik, which is the south southernmost point of Iceland. And he was there every summer as a boy. So we can just, you know, learn about the boy learning how to milk cows and rake the hay, but Sveted takes us into the life of the farmhouse and how the, the beds were arranged, the males on one side and the women on the other. And that was the Balstovan. And then there were readings in the evening to um, keep everyone entertained. And there was an outhouse and you just learn all these things. And so that's what I mean by placing this all in context. And so you can really learn a lot from this book. And I loved learning even more about Iceland. I have to tell you this one little thing um, that I enjoyed reading of, among many things. And that is when Sveti was a small boy, um, he, the, the, the occupation started. Now, so the occupation began in 1940, the Allied occupation during World War II of Iceland. So Sveri lived at the top of Tjarnargata, which is very close to the street called Ringbreut. If you cross Ringbreut, you are at the university. The Allied forces commandeered that whole area and turned it into a camp for soldiers. So Sveted and his friend, two very small boys, collected dandelions and crossed Ringbreit and negotiated with the soldiers for chocolate. So chocolate was the first word in English that Sveted learned. But you can, you, you get the feeling though of the impact of the occupation of, uh, uh, of Iceland on the 
few, the very small population of Iceland from this story that the boys were just running across the street and they were in the camp. So uh, I really appreciated that. And I, I just want to read a little bit from the book to show you how I think um, Sverrir uh, and Veronica too, both approached this, this, the writing of these memories. So it's on page five of the book and Sverrir imagines himself telling his grandchildren that they will discover, and this in quotes, that their lives aren't just the sum of their own experiences. Instead, they will find out life is a relay. Every leg is a continuation of the previous one. To understand themselves, they have to understand those who have gone before them. So I, I love that quotation. So I am just about to turn you over to Veronica Lee and Sveta to tell us the why and the how of their book. But I am going to be listening very carefully in the hopes that you will answer the question that your book awakened in me. And that is the question, um, how does a man who is so rooted in Iceland and so and, and loves Iceland so much, and he's just so much a part of Iceland, develops such a spirit of adventure that he's ready to see the whole world and just keep traveling. So, so many Icelanders just wouldn't be able to bear that, I don't think. So I find this so interesting in, in the person of Sverid. So. I'm going to stop now and ask you the ultimate question, which is what caused you, both of you, to write this book? Thank you, Solari. <clears throat> um, uh, let me try to answer that question while <clears throat> Veronica is showing the, the, the cover of the book. Uh, and this is the area where I spent summers. As a, uh, as a youngster. <clears throat> but uh, on your question of why I wrote the book, I've traveled a lot in my life, visited 60 countries, uh, worked in 30. And when I told stories of my ad travel adventures to friends, um, their uh, reaction was often, why don't you write a book about your, um, uh, about your adventures, your memoir? So I started jotting down bits and pieces of uh, what I had done. Um, uh, saving them in a folder I called um, uh, episodes on my hard drive. It's a little bit like dumping photos into a shoebox. And um, uh, then I showed a few snippets of that to Veronica. And um, who is, as Solveig said, uh, uh, who is a, a former journal, journalist and a published author. So um, what did you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> OK, this happened well into his retirement uh, when he's done everything he wanted to do. He needed a new project. So I was going to just pat him on the back and say, great job, Sarah, keep on writing, stay busy. But after I read about 10 pages of it, I said to him, Sarah, you have a really interesting life. Um, I've heard about his travels before, bits and pieces of it, but I never realized how extreme his travels were until he wrote them down and connected the dots for me. That was when I decided I have to help him turn these episodes into a book. And um, I've written a memoir before, and so I have some experience in doing this. OK, the, the snippets, the stories that showed Veronica about my travels um, were basically from the Middle East. Uh, after finishing my assignment there, <clears throat> I drove from Kuwait here to Copenhagen, and this took me all over the Middle East, uh, through Iran up to the Caspian Sea, 
from there uh, over through Iraq over to Jordan, Syria, Turkey, from there to Bulgaria, former Yugoslavia, Austria, Germany, and Denmark. Um, and uh, many of these parts uh, there are or have been um, recently war zones. Many of you are familiar with the city of Fallujah, the Anbar province, and of course the cities in Syria. Um, many of the roads at the time were not really roads, they were just tracks, desert tracks, and the sandstorms were something to experience. Uh, we even encountered bandits and narrowly ex escaped. And this was all together with my, my uh, former wife and son who sat with me in the car. Uh, but I was young and crazy then, maybe I still am. And what doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. Well, I'm glad I wasn't married to him then. Okay, so this is a lot about his travels, but we didn't want to make it into a travel log. We wanted to tell a story that reveals who Sarah is. We wanted to probe his inner life to find out what makes him take these extreme trips. What makes him a modern Viking? Uh, so that became the theme of the book. Once we had a theme to focus on, we had a, a, like a backbone to hang his episodes on. And these become the building blocks of a story. And so it wasn't just a, a shoebox of memories. Um, okay. To understand me, you really have to uh, start with where I come from, and uh, <clears throat> Solveig has really uh, um, explained a lot of that in her introduction. Um, so part one of the book we call Icelandic Roots, which reached back to my grandfather and beyond. And, um, and then, of course, I grew up in Iceland during during war times, um, and um, uh, Iceland is actually in the middle of the, you know, situated in the middle of the North Atlantic. Um, it is of superb strategic importance, especially both during the Second World War. And, uh, <clears throat> and later during the Cold War. Um, before the Second World War, few people really knew Iceland. Um, but be when Iceland become, became better known sort of because of its strategic position, it managed to build on that and um, um, grew economically from um, a very poor nation to a, a prosperous one. And while Iceland was coming of age, I was growing up too. Um, as Solveig said, I, in the barracks next door to home, I went uh, to, take, to, to, to beg for chocolates you next uh, at, at, from the soldiers. Uh, here you see this very elegant looking uh, uh, barracks. Uh, and of course the um, entire um, idea or, or, or the root of the occupation was that the, the Brits at that time were trying to uh, prevent Hitler from dominating the North Atlantic. Uh, from uh, a much from a very young age, I've been aware of a, a, a much bigger world out there, um, and this experience, together with the Viking sagas that I read, and influenced me enormously, gave me a strong desire to um, uh, see the rest of the world. So the second part of the book is called Viking Adventures. Is about Sverre traveling the world to seek his fortune, so to speak. Modern Vikings no longer go around looting and plundering, but they travel to learn, to study, 
and to compete professionally on the world stage. At 19, Sarah struck out on his own, having acquired a very good education from the excellent schools in Reykjavik. He went to Finland to study architecture. After he graduated, he carried out a three-year plan to see the world. So he spent a year and a half in the Middle East and then six years in Africa working for the UN. And then finally he was hired by the World Bank. Uh, this is the world's largest aid agency and is based in Washington, DC. Over the course of 20 years, the World Bank sent him to 30 developing countries, mostly to uh, work on building schools and improving education systems. So his three year plan turned out to be 60 years and counting. Mm. Um, I'm one of those um, Vikings, if I may call myself that, who never went home. Um, I settled in the US, and where I like it, uh, but I think mentally and emotionally, um, I've gone full circles. Uh, I've discovered who I am, an Icelander. What do you mean by that? Um, what I mean by that is um, the sagas had a big influence on me. The sagas, for those who are unfamiliar with it, are accounts of Icelanders who lived in Iceland in the 12th, 13th century. Um, in fact, actually much earlier. Um, and uh, it talks about how my ancestors traveled all over the world, often long distances in open boats, weathering wind and weather. And uh, in many ways, I can imagine myself <clears throat> actually being on these boats. Um, and then um, when I land, the sights I see and the people I may meet would be worth all the hardship. Um, but then best of all, I would say, especially if I had a drink or two, I could brag about my adventures to my friends and, uh, and tell stories that uh, would probably bore people to death, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I think I should answer that question. I have lived with this guy for more than 30 years and I co-wrote his memoir, so I understand what he is. Sarah is adventurous to the point of being a danger to himself and to others. I'll give you an example. Uh, shortly after I met him, he took me skiing. Remember, I was born in Thailand and grew up in Hong Kong. I'd never seen snow and of course knew nothing about skiing. So on um, one of the trips, not the first one, maybe the second or third one, he took me up to a black diamond slope. And then without saying a word to me, he disappeared down the slope. <laughs> so what was I supposed to do? I had to go after him because that's the only way out. And my knees have never been the same since. Uh, well, we Chinese have a saying that who you are at the age of three determines who you are at 80. Sfera has been an adventurer since the age of three. Uh, Iceland, as you know, is a very safe country, uh, even in wartime. Mothers let their kids go out to play once they're old enough. And in Iceland, that age is three. So three-year-old Sfera uh, would be playing in, um, in, in a dirt field close to home. And that field was right next to an airstrip where warplanes took off and landed. And then one time a plane didn't make it. It crashed and exploded into flames right where Sperry was playing. He was fine, he wasn't hurt, but that scene was seared into his memory. And then later on at the age, uh, the ripe old age of nine, 
he was sent to the countryside to work on a farm in the summer. Now that's nothing special to Sverre because many Icelandic kids do that. Uh, and he did that every year until he was 14. And on his days off, he and a boy in the next farm uh, would go traipsing all around the mountains and glaciers of Myrdala. And the escapades they got into were really scary. It's a miracle that this guy is alive today. Svera is fearless and his wanderlust knows no bounds. I too worked at the World Bank and after about four or five years of it, uh, which meant tra traveling three to four months out of a year, I switched to a job that was more desk work. But Svera never got tired of traveling. Even after he retired, he went back to the World Bank to work as a consultant and continued to travel. He just couldn't kick the Viking habit. But one, one thing I do admire of him is his reading habit. Um, on a dark rainy day, he would sit back in his chair with a book and read from morning till night, stopping only to eat. Now, I, I don't like to stereotype, but I think of this as typical Icelandic behavior. Uh, Iceland is known to be one of the most literate nations in the world. And they say one out of 10 Icelanders would publish a book in his lifetime. Mm. One of them is Sarah, and the other one is Sovik. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you kind of answered my question about the uh, being rooted and seeking adventure because he sought adventure in Iceland already. So it wasn't like he had to leave the country to seek adventure. Now, I really am very, very curious um, about one thing. Uh, well, we're always curious about writing process, but it's very difficult, I think, for two people or compounds the difficulty when there are two people involved. So I'm, uh, I'm very impressed by your research, for one thing, uh, the detail, the many details of everything that you give us. Um, how did you manage to remember all of that? Well, you mentioned all those snippets in the shoebox. Like, was that enough? Um, and um, yeah, and I would, Okay, that's part. That's the part of the process I'm interested in. But I and I think you're also. I'm also curious about the Viking theme, how that shapes the memoir, and that you may have already answered that when you talked about the backbone of the story. You may have already answered, started to answer that. But but I, I'm I'm also interested in theme, how that how that helped you organize. Okay, in order to tell a story, uh, you really have to have a theme. And uh, Veronica was, of course, the, the main designer of the thing. But uh, coming back to your question of how I remember things or, or how I researched um, uh, material for the book, uh, I'm a bit of a pack rat. So um, I've kept a lot of documents. Uh, old passports, uh, my study record in Finland, employment record in Finland, back to office reports and um, reports of my, uh, my travel um, in, in the World Bank and so on. And then my dad also uh, kept a diary of his uh, trip to, uh, for medical reasons, to, to England in 1949 which helped me write that part of the memoir. And the family accounts, both written and oral, <clears throat> were invaluable. Um, I was also lucky to have an aunt who um, re recently died at the age of 103, but was still very sharp. Uh, and she remembers very well uh, bits and pieces of the, uh, of the British occupation of Iceland, especially 
She was still scandalized about the behavior of young women in Iceland at the time where Iceland had been flooded with um, an equal number of foreign males as the Icelandic um, uh, males were at the time. Um, and then there is Uncle Oli, who is my, who is my uh, uh, mother's brother. Um, he was supposed to be on the ship that my grandfather and uh, son uh, drowned on back in 1910, but because of uh, school obligations, he uh, had to stay behind. Um, and much later in life, the, um, the uh, National Library of Iceland interviewed him as part of a cultural heritage project. I contacted the librarian and she sent me um, uh, files of his uh, uh, tales, audio files. I clicked on them and th there was my uncle Ole telling us about his growing up in, um, uh, in, in Iceland and being a little kid on a 10 year old kid on a, on a sailing vessel in, um, in the North Atlantic. And then there is the internet, of course. Uh, you can find anything on the internet these days. And we found one site. This is a very useful site, timarit.is. Um, some years ago, the National Library of Iceland um, and several other libraries in, in Faroe Islands, Greenland, uh, join hands to digitize every newspaper article uh, and every periodical printed since the beginning of news publishing in the 1800s. So every single article can be found in this site and you know it's available for free. And um... I was talking as for, about, our, about our collaboration. Yeah, as for the collaboration, uh, the process has been mostly congenial. You can see we are still married and talking to each other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and the reason for this congeniality is that we really complement each other. Uh, where I am stronger, um, she defers to me and vice versa. But it does annoy me sometimes when uh, she asks me about my feelings and other people's feelings. I can describe uh, hardware, places and things, but, uh, but uh, when it uh, comes to human e emotions and signals, I'm really a moron. Um, in the beginning, we got quite frustrated with each other, but uh, but uh, I, I would eventually give her the facts and, uh, and we would make our differences work. Um, I'll give you an example. When my mother had polio when I was 12, um, so I wound up um, cooking cods and potatoes and uh, while well, she was basically bedridden. Um, I described this to her, but she said, this is very, very cold. So she then had a look at it and turned it into, into something um, um, very emotional, very feeling how my mother was laying in bed, trying to not be a nuisance, but eventually managed to come, come, come uh, to life and uh, walk again. Well, I have to explain, I wasn't being nosy. Uh, you have to describe a person's inner life because what he thinks and feels is as important as what he does. Well, um, there was one awkward subject that we had to write about, and that was his ex-wife, my predecessor. She was married to him for 20 years, 
and was as fanatic about traveling as he was. But all he wanted to say about her was that she was crazy and then never mentioned her again. I said, this is not right because she was a very important part of your life uh, and of your travels. You have to give credit where it's due. Uh, so we devoted one whole chapter to Monica to explain where she came from and where she grew up, uh, which was in Finland during its wars with Russia. Um, on the whole, we agreed on the, on the major items. Um, as I said before, we agreed on the theme, uh, which is the making of a modern writing. Um, and, uh, and this sort of gave us, gave us framework for, uh, uh, for the book. We also agreed on with the saying that biography is, uh, is history, at least this major part of history. Um, although my memoir is a personal story, uh, it's also a window to a much bigger picture. picture. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, my growing up in Iceland is also of um, an account of Iceland growing up uh, on its own. Well, it's the same with his adventures. Although they were his personal adventures, they also tell a bigger story. After the Second World War, the world's nations got together to heal and to help each other. It was a period of renaissance and Sverer in his travels, he was able to witness it and also to take part in it. His memoir is full of information about the history and culture of the uh, places he worked in. I, I think you did a wonderful job of explaining your collaboration. I hope you write another book together because I love the way you complement one another. Now you mentioned um, adventures, so I wonder, do any of your ad adventures really stand out as the most memorable? Okay, let me mention a very crazy period in my life. Um, when I was working in the Middle East, <clears throat> uh, I got the job of supervising the construction of the Palace and the harem of the ruler of Abu Dhabi. Now this looks grand, uh, but this is actually the successor palace to the ruler of Abu Dhabi. But the same principles apply. Here is the main, here is the main palace. And here in the background are the little mini palaces where the, <coughs> quote harem, uh, where, the, um, where the four wives and their children um, live. Um, this was indeed an adventure. And after the Middle East, I went to Africa to do much tamer jobs. Um, I worked for, inst for three years in Swaziland, which at that time had recently become uh, independent of, uh, of British rule. And this is a picture, aerial picture of the school uh, that I was that I was building uh, or supervising the construction of. These are the classroom blocks that I uh, I worked uh, at and uh, still serve a valuable pur purpose, including a couple of additional classrooms. Uh, you can actually see it today on Google uh, Earth, and uh, if you search for um, a Swazi National High School. You can see both this and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, more buildings that uh, we, we built in that time. Uh, one of the highlights of his career in the World Bank was helping communist China rejoin the world community. In 1980, he was on one of the first missions of the World Bank to China to see how they could help them develop and um, catch up. And everywhere Sperry went, he was treated like royalty and thousands of school children would come out to dance for him. <laughs> Here are some of them. 
And Sparrow, here he is, in his homemade Icelandic sweater. Laying my blessing <laughs> over that piece of machinery. I'm trying to look regal. Well, with a bit of help from, from the bank and others, China has caught up. Uh, by the way, that was also how Sfera and I met. We were both working for the World Bank on China. And uh, that's a different kind of adventure. Well, it sounds like um, you've kept very busy since you retired from the World Bank, writing a book and probably doing various other things. Is there something else that you would like to mention that keeps you busy and passionate and engaged? Uh, yes. And um, when I retired, I sort of reverted to my roots, which was growing up in a <clears throat> wood workshop in the basement of our house in, in Tjarnagata. Uh, so I designed and built my own house on the eastern shore of Maryland. Now, many architects um, designed their houses, uh, but very few of them actually built them with their own two hands. So um, when I was a kid making things, I was playing with Legos, but uh, this was literally <coughs> um, uh, um, building a, a Lego on a, on a much grander scale. Yeah, there you see me um, building a super Lego on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, Great. The, um, the whole thing took about seven years because I, I was really working in the World Bank at the time of time also. But but here you see the um, um, the completed uh, um, house next to the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, Solvik. So, um, and where is your book available? Aha, uh -huh. here it is. Mm. Uh, we have some copies at home and we're selling them at discount at my website, veronicalee.com. And please note, Lee is spelled as L-I, one of the shortest last names. Mm. And uh, we will sign the books before we send them out. Mm -hmm. Or you can get them at Amazon.com. Uh, they're in both paperback and ebook. Um, and I'm also um, translating it into Icelandic. <clears throat> uh, my Icelandic is rather rusty. In particular, it is 60 years out of date, uh, but it's gradually coming back. I finished the entire manuscript and I'm working with an editor to um, finalize it. And um, so I guessed who the readers might be for the book, but I'd like to hear it from you. What kind of reader do you think uh, might most enjoy the book? Um, well, immediately I was thinking of the audience to this, um, uh, this broadcast that is uh, people in North America or in the English speaking world who are um, or have some connections to Iceland. Uh, also people who are or have been traveling to Iceland and are interested in more than just the scenery, the beautiful scenery they see, but because much of the book, first part of the book is actually sort of a, um, a, a history of, of Iceland uh, in the context of one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also um, people of, yeah, people who have, have been or are interested in international um, um, aid work or working abroad, generally speaking, um, because it really broadens the mind. Um, I would like to encourage young people to travel abroad, play Viking for a year or two, 
which will give them the opportunity to grow up and, uh, and, uh, and become more mature. <laughs> well, I, I agree that the book uh, has a, a, a great deal of um, pleasant presentation of history. You know, it's t told through uh, individuals, individual experiences. I found that that very interesting. And um, as, as well as the um, part about, about uh, development uh, and the work of the World Bank, all of those things I found very, very interesting. So um, is there anything you would like to add? We've come to the end of um, this interview, but you may, I don't have any more questions. Would you like, to, is there something you want to add before we finish? Just, uh, just to say thank you, Solveig and, uh, um, and Diane, <coughs> to um, um, organize this interview. And I, will, and I hope that uh, whoever was listening uh, thought this was entertaining and uh, informative. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You both, Veronica and Sveder, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to hear. And thank you very much, um, Solveig, as well as Svater and Veronica. What an interesting program and uh, what an interesting life you have lived, Svater. <laughs> I have a question for you. Um, and I would like to remind people that if you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Uh, we've got a few minutes left that we can use to answer your question. Um, but uh, when you joined the World Bank or when you started your travel strategy, did you have in mind a particular purpose uh, or were you just out to see the world and let, let life uh, come to you as it came? Uh, interesting question. I had been building schools uh, in Africa for three years working with the World Bank there, and it was really an honor to be invited to join the ranks of the World Bank to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, become part of a much broader job than I had, had been doing in Africa. At the same time, I must admit that when I came to Washington, I found that instead of being uh, a huge fish in a tiny pond. I was suddenly a minute cog in a huge bureaucracy and it took me several years to uh, figure out how to deal with that change of my life. Okay. Yeah, I think in the beginning when he went overseas, it's for adventure. He didn't really know uh, what he wanted to do. So any opportunity is fine. So the first opportunity was in Kuwait. And, um, and that was right after the end of the Six Day War. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were still signs of, of war going on there. I, so he was there working for a private company and he did things like supervising the construction of a harem. <laughs> So there, there was uh, no idealistic objective he had in mind, just any job. And then he got more and more because of the availability of jobs in that area of international aid and Africa, African countries were becoming independent and needing help. And so he um, got into that in Africa and he did that for what, six years. And then that was a natural transition to the World Bank. Very good, very good. Uh, we have another question. Um, if you have, if you have it, children, are they as adventurous as you have been? Um, okay, my <clears throat> my son spent a significant part of his very early years uh, sitting happily in the back seat of a car when we were driving and traipsing all over uh, the Middle East and beyond. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that they have decided that uh, this kind of life was exciting enough 
and they have settled for a, a much more, um, shall we say, sedate existence. My son in Sweden, my daughter um, lives in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, I think that's about, um, uh, that's about it that I have to say about uh, their ideas of um, uh, adventures. Well, my son <laughs> went to oh. Iceland and lived there for a year. I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he he <clears throat> he's a pianist, and he went to a conservatory in um, New Orleans. No, um, in in Iceland was it in Dalvik, in Dalvik, oh. yeah. And he he stayed there for a year and taught there, and that really changed his life. He came back a totally different person. For those who don't know the geography of Iceland, um, Dalvik is. Uh, located in the central North Iceland, um, I would say. Uh, yeah, so that gives you an idea that if you are located in the school where he was teaching, uh, it would take him five minutes to walk down to the harbor, five minutes to walk to the church, and five minutes to walk up to the ski lift. So uh, that is where he and he was very excited about it <clears throat> the first month he was there uh, when well, the sun was still shining but the mountains are very tall in that part of the world so the sun basically disappeared sometime in November and didn't show itself until, until uh, uh, February and that was for him a very depressing period. Anyway, back to what he said about his children. Although they didn't, they are not traveling the world the way you did, what they learned in their childhood when they were traveling with you has changed them, uh, shapes them as grown ups. They mingle very easily with people of different cultures and races. And nowadays it's important. The world is so small, everybody is together. So they, um, I, I, I think the ease with which they mingled with people of all kinds has something to do with how they grew up. Well, thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I see two, uh, two questions on that question and answer button. Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've answered them actually. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just okay. haven't taken them off the list. Um, but uh, again, thank you so much, Better. I think you absolutely have modeled the Viking adventure. And uh, uh, thank you so much for writing a book that, that shares, shares your experience and as you call them, your episodes. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. I, thank you, Diane and Solveig and Doug. You're welcome. Well, I'd like to just um, talk uh, for a minute or two about uh, uh, the next upcoming program that we have. November, we're really focusing on authors. So besides tonight's uh, program, we have another author or another author's corner called the Author's Corner Duet uh, coming up on Sunday, November 15th at uh, nine o'clock Eastern, eight Central, seven Mountain and six Pacific, where we'll be talking to two children's authors. We will have Eric Newman, who wrote uh, Lundy, The Last Puffin for young children. And we will have Amy Hendrickson, uh, also known as Ms. Hen, the author of Laura of the North. So, uh, you know, we're trying to help you get your Christmas lists put together. So I hope you can join us at that time. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to come and see us. and. Uh, and talk with us today. And thank you, um, attendees, for participating and uh, giving us your time. Good night. <laughs>